Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Butter What Show. I'm uh, your host, Pat Regan, and I'm here with uh, the DIY NAS guy once again today here, BrianCMoses.com. And we're going to chat about uh, the 2022 do-it-yourself NAS build that he just posted not too many days ago. And we could ask him why, if he knows that it's still 2021. And I am aware of that. I've, I've always aspired to be like the automakers and be so far ahead that I'm releasing products before the year even Do ends. I have a 2023 Tesla yet? No, probably not. But if you did, the panels wouldn't align and it'd probably rattle when you drove real fast. Nice. <laughs> So, sorry, Elon. Yeah, I uh, just before Thanksgiving, I've I finished up. I put the finishing touches on the blog for the DIY NAS 2022 edition. Nice. Um, this year, this year I was so this year I decided that I wanted to upgrade my own DIY NAS. In addition to all my other DIY NAS activities, um, I wanted to to move it into the awesome 3D printed case and upgrade its RAM. And in pricing out RAM to double the RAM that I had in the, had in the machine, it was 32 gigs. Well, it was ECC to DDR3. DDR3 registered, I think. Not um, the one that's always cheap on eBay. Not, not the, the one that's that always cheap. From servers. Yeah, the, the really hard to find expensive stuff. It was going to cost for the RAM alone to go from 32 to 64 gigabytes, it was going to cost 800 bucks. And I, no, I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, it, I built it in 2016. It's been fantastic, but there's no point in spending $800 for that small of an upgrade, unless maybe it was a GPU in this day and age. I'd be excited about that. You know, I got, I wound up deciding, Hey, I'm going to build a whole brand new NAS, but I can't do two different, I can't spend that much money this year on DIY NAS builds. So the next one, I'm just going to build it and keep it. And I'm going to build, I'm going to call it my perfect DIY NAS. Not necessarily something that I'd recommend everybody do, but I wanted something. This meets your needs. Perfect for me. It meets my needs. Um, it's, it's tailored to, you know, if I, I like to, my last name's Moses, so I like to joke about 10 commandments. But if I had 10 commandments of DIY NAS building, this one meets all of them. And I usually, you know, usually every year I wind up. I'm going to put in Mel, Book, Mel Brooks dropping the third tablet. Please do. Right here. Third tablet. <laughs> Definitely. That's fair use, <laughs> right? So, yeah, usually when I, when I build a DIY NAS, you know, I kind of state what my what my ideal is, and then I have to compromise because things are expensive or I want to try something new. Um, but I didn't, I didn't this time around, there wasn't much compromise and I built it perfect for me. I don't know the model. We, Pat's I've, gonna got, put I've it up. got them all up here. I'll, I'm going to ask you, Pat's I'm going to ask you questions, Tubby, to keep, we'll, okay. we'll do a good job here. Now I noticed you got the, a pair of one terabyte uh, SATA SSDs in here. Yeah, I, I heard you did something controversial, and you partitioned I these did. up to use them for multiple things. Uh, unsupported, and I've I've had shade thrown at me for doing it. Um, I wound up deciding to buy, well, one terabyte SSDs. It's a two and a half inch SSD. They're at about a hundred bucks per terabyte. And that's, I mean, that's an awesome price for SSDs. And the recommended thing, you know, the thing that people tell you to do is just go buy the cheapest SSD you can find or use a, you know, like a SATA DOM. For and your operating are, system. For your operating system. Yeah, I apologize. For the operating system. And those are expensive. On a, like the SATA, and I, they're garbage. I did the math. That's yeah, what I got I, out of looking at the SATA DOMs. They're just, it's junk flash on a SATA port. With a SATA connector. Yeah. Yeah, I did, I did the math. The SATA DOMs at a, about $1,575 per terabyte. Right, I mean, if you did and, the math, it's about just, as good as a micro SD card. Yeah, it's uh, sixty bucks for a thirty-two gig, and the and the terabyte SSD that I picked out was a hundred bucks. But you, so you ended up you put a slice on the front of the drive for your operating system, and then a big slice at the end for your 
caching, sorry, ZFS cache. Well, stuff. and I, I opted not even to do any caching. I'm just going to use it for, uh, I'm going to call it fast storage. I, I expect that what I'll probably do is put like my virtual machines in Linux containers on it. Yeah, you're doing a, you're and doing about what I did on mine. Yeah, too. good. Yeah, we used to have there's to a do mirror. this in the old like in the days when you had hardware RAID cards. If you bought a one use server with four drives, you pretty much you just had to do a you could do a RAID ten on it or whatever you you had to do what you had to do. But then when we started using software RAID with Linux. You might say, well, I want to put a RAID 5 on there because I only have four drives and I want to, you know, have as much usable space as I can but still have redundancy. But Linux can't boot off of a RAID 5. You need a, you need okay. a RAID 1 or a RAID 10 in there somewhere. So you just take a few gigabytes off the front, you know, put a RAID 1 on it, put your OS on it, and then RAID 5 the rest of it. And, but you were constrained because you only had four drives. You couldn't add a fifth drive to a one U server. That's just what you Yeah. And four was the, not a lot. It's not like you could waste you a pair of drives for your OS and then have an eight drive, you know, exactly. Five yeah, and the, six. You... the case that I used, well the MK seven thirty five, you know, you're I was I was at the limit, you know, between my two SSDs and seven seven hard drives. I was at the limit of what I could fit in there. What about SATA ports? Um, I did not have enough SATA ports. This is... But when you added a card, this, you would have enough. You, you I have did. more too I many. Had, not too many. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have plenty now. But um, what I'm saying is I encourage everybody to partition your stuff like this because you're going to... Something is going to cost you more money. Either adding more... Getting enough SATA ports to do more than... More drives yeah. is going to... You can always find a place to cram an SSD up in... God, you should see the places I've seen people cram drives in there. Well, and they're they're light enough. You could just velcro them. Yeah, to something and they don't vibrate. Next they to don't the power do anything. Supply. Yeah, it's not a. I, I won't even tell you about the janky ways I've mounted hard drive. I mean, hard drives, seventy two hundred RPM hard drives. In, in the four eighty six days, one of my friends yeah. had one of those cheap. Those cheap drives that only had one platter in them. They were three and a half inch drives, but they were really flat. Oh, not the Seagate Bigfoot yeah. ones. Yeah, they had like. Oh, not the big. They foot. were five and a. They were like five and a quarter. Yeah, no, this drives. was a little skinny thing. He crammed okay. it in at the top of his case above all of the drive five and a quarter inch drive bays. There was a cutout in the top. You know, after you took the lid off, he just set it in this little, this little thin space up there and hid it in there. It was the jankiest did a good thing job. I've ever seen. I've probably done worse. Oh, I know I have. I <laughs> I had a motherboard, a Pentium 200, a Cyrix P200, that didn't quite line up with the screw holes in the case. I just had a PCI anti-static bubble wrap underneath, and the only thing yeah, holding I, it in were the PCI cards. I've done that too, except I think I had a standoff or two in the right spot. There could have been. Don't we? Didn't, we can't. I don't have a picture. We didn't have digital cameras back then. But we're going off topic from the NAS here, Toby. Uh, a little bit. The, the adventures of DIY. I'm going to go back to the picture here because this case is tremendous. The case is amazing. 3D Weebies, 3D printed case is fantastic. How long did this take to print? Two weeks. So long that I didn't measure like specific hours and minutes. I, I had a, there are a couple parts that took like 48 hours to print. And I had a couple, I mean, we talked, well, not in this episode, but in a prior episode, we talked about, we talked about how long um, some of my first layer problems, but I had a couple things peel up. So I think start to finish, it was at least two weeks of constant printing on my 3D printer. I believe this. It's so beautiful. It's like a work of art, Brian. It, it really is. I had. I'm ecstatic. It, I, it's I feel it's not the densest ITX case I've ever seen, but it's not no, it's, that big. It's it's just roomy enough that it seems comfortable to work in it. Yeah, and I was I was surprised. Like I, you know, I don't, you can see it over my shoulder. It's right next to my other mini ITX case. I I was still surprised at how dense it was. And you really, the nice thing about it is, the nice thing about it is that it's a. Uh, 
the drives are under the motherboard, so they're not they're not crammed in the same space like they are in my in my other case. Yep, I remember watching so, you do something with your other case, and it's like a jigsaw puzzle, getting at a particular part, and then if you don't put it back together right, you have to redo it and change the order. And but that is a super that I don't know the name of that case, but the old one. It's the UNAS NSC 800? I'll write it up. Or 810. I can't remember. But it's super dense. Two, I don't need that much space in my office. I'm happy to have yep. a few extra feet of air in my case. Just so I don't have tiny hands. I like to be able to get in there. I love, I mean, I love that. that it's that a fantastic UNAS case. NS, it's a fantastic case. I And I had a... I've since moved, but once upon a time, my office was much smaller, and I had a very narrow space, and it fit perfectly in that in that one spot. And I I hated assembling it and putting it together, but once it was together, I was really happy with it. And because I didn't want to take it apart, you know, my intention after printing printing this case, I finished that. I want to say it's been a year or so, but I. I was so adverse to working inside, you know, taking apart something that was working just fine and moving it that that the MK735 was sadly neglected longer than it than it should have been. Well, you've been busy, Tubby. It happened. Yeah. It happened. But I'm I'm super excited. I I haven't moved into it yet, but I will slowly start migrating into that right now. I'm still kind of playing around with what I built. I've got my all my old drives that I've upgraded from in there and I'm kind of I guess burning it in yeah. getting to getting to know it. It looks like you've got 10 gigabit ethernet in here. Yep, it's got two 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 10 gigabit ethernet RJ45 which was a bummer. That my uh my switch, all my stuff that I have right now is is SFP plus. So I had to I had to buy those Funny little transceivers. Yep. I haven't used those yet. So uh, what, uh, are you running free NAS on here, Brian? Well, I yeah, I've, I've stuck with that universe. They've rebranded free NAS into true NAS core. And that's that's what's running on my other NAS. But they've, they're have they on the verge of releasing true NAS scale. Okay. And I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. The, Simplifying it, but the big difference is that TrueNAS Core is based off of FreeBSD, and TrueNAS Scale is, I think Debian. Okay. Debian Linux. Um, and one of the one of the big advantages of TrueNAS Scale is that it, you can do you can do a lot more. You know the containerization and Docker's, and what I'm hoping, is that I'm going to be able to retire both, my old DIY NAS and my home lab machine. And consolidate them all onto a single piece of hardware. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm real excited about the, uh, that. I'd be excited because I know you've had trouble in previous DIY NASs. Some hardware you ended up having to rule out because it wasn't friendly with FreeBSD yet. And FreeNAS yeah. being behind the FreeBSD releases means it's even farther behind. But nobody builds server hardware that doesn't work with Linux anymore yeah hardware compatibility is a big is, is a big bonus of scale in my opinion it's exciting tubby i'm excited Thanks. 